gentleman from the uh, State Fire Marshal Association come up and speak, and then we'll take questions. When it's your turn to speak, go up to the podium. There's a microphone there. Uh, state your name and address for the record, and uh, there's a five-minute time limit. Um, please don't speak out of turn. I'm going to try to get to everyone. Um, so there's a lot of people here. So the uh, calmer, more respectful it can be, the faster the proceedings go. So, Mr. Heaton. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Um, I just want to make sure that the entire community knows that the whole point of having this community as a whole is to make sure that we listen and learn from everybody uh, in the community of what you want to see. Uh, but most importantly, it's about keeping our citizens safe. And today and moving forward, that will be the objective. And our goal as a council, I can't speak for everybody, but I can speak for myself, is to make sure that um, everybody's opinion is taken into account, but um, we are going to keep our citizens safe. That is our number one responsibility. And uh, moving forward, that will be my goal. Uh, just like Mr. Heaven said, I want to hear from the public. Um, it's council's priority to keep everyone safe. Um, there hasn't been a decision made yet. We're all still, at least in, in, from my standpoint, we're still in the fact-finding um, stages, so the more information we can share, the better. Um, I didn't mention we have our city administrator and finance director and law directors all here that'll help with answering questions if there's something we can't answer. I'd like to echo what one of my other council members have said. I do want safety to be on board priority. I understand sometimes the easiest answer isn't always the right answer also. I also agree I have an open mind. I do agree we're in a back funding mission. We are not ready to help anything at this point. I hope this answers a lot of my questions and a lot of your questions tonight. And please contact me at any time if you have anything you need to talk about. We've hit a lot of topics, so I won't be very long. Um, <clears throat> you know everything uh, that they, I'm echoing all the sentiments of Cynthia. But um, I want to make sure that, that the citizens realize that I have not made a decision personally. Uh, the, the council has not made a decision. Um, and, and we want to understand where everybody stands before we can move forward. Um, an idea that it's going to be a fast track, from my standpoint, is not going to happen. It's a 50, 60 year decision that needs the, the, the proper time to develop. As everybody else is set up here, I'd like to thank everybody for coming and uh, look forward to hearing comments. Our residents are our number one product, our, our number one issue, and keeping their safe is number one on the ride. That's all. I just want to say again, thank you to everyone for coming, for being willing to express your voices and hoping to be heard. I also have not made a decision. One of my top priorities in this process has been to make sure that there's enough public input, enough fact-finding, like Caroline said, to be able to make a qualified decision about what we're going to do. This meeting is a huge part of that decision. And so again, I just want to echo that this is why we're having this, to make sure that we're hearing those voices. Uh, now I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Cook to come to the microphone and speak. Thank you. Is there a mic laying there? First of all, thank you for uh, inviting me tonight to uh, speak before the citizenry and the elected officials. Uh, my name is Frank Cook, and I represent the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. Uh, obviously, there was a study done, oh, roughly about a year ago. Yes. Yeah, talk right. About now. Is it, check one. is it on? About now. Oh, yeah. 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 All right. 
All right, first of all, uh, I want to thank you for the invitation to come and speak before you this evening. Uh, again, my name is Frank Cook. I represent the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. And uh, while I was not the principal consultant uh, on the study that was conducted, the feasibility study, again, you know, I'm here to represent the Fire Chiefs Association <coughs> and speak to you about uh, primarily two topics. And that's uh, regionalization of fire department services and recruitment and staffing uh, within the fire department. A little bit about myself. Uh, I've been in the fire service for uh, about 40 years now. Uh, I served 36 years with Colerain Township Fire Department down in the Cincinnati, Ohio area. I, uh, last six years of my tenure, I served as fire chief. And currently, I serve as Director of Consulting Services for the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association. So having said that, um, you know, I understand the difficult situation that you as elected officials are in currently, and uh, the situations and the concerns you as citizens have here in the uh, community of Rossville. As far as uh, regionalization is concerned. You know, my understanding of how things are situated currently is that you have three options that are on the table for consideration as far as fire, providing fire protection uh, to the city here. I will say that you know, I'm not advocating any one of the three. I'm just here to provide information and to answer any questions uh, that you may have uh, and moving forward with providing fire protection services here in the city. As far as regionalization is concerned, um, regionalization is also termed uh, providing fire protection by means of a fire district. That's the term that's used uh, here in uh, Ohio. I mean, you can refer to it as consolidation, regionalization, but uh, Departments that uh, have consolidated or regionalized uh, have formed uh, what's called fire districts. It's nothing new to the state. There's fire districts, there's ambulance districts all throughout the state. Uh, the formations of these districts, some have been successful, some have not. I'll just be quite honest with you uh, in the formation of these fire districts. Um, you know, we see businesses merge or consolidate almost on a daily basis. Sometimes with a peaceful integration of goods, services, and their staff. Other times we see hostile servers and generally people, products, and product lines are eliminated. The fire service is a bit different uh, than big businesses in the private sector, but not much when it comes to money, people, <coughs> products and services provided by the fire departments. <clears throat> fire department mergers, consolidation, annexations, or the formation of districts can be described in one word, in my opinion. Complicated, but it's not impossible. There are five important factors or elements of a consolidation or regionalization that are important to consider during any type of merger or consolidation. Those being people, culture, money, politics, and state statute. The devil is, is in the numerous details leading to the success, but ignoring these five issues or elements, uh, you will find certain failure and maybe not success. Um, you know, when we talk about people, I think all of us realize that people are our most important resource and we have to remember the combining an organization uh, you know everyone is going to have some level of anxiety you know that fear of the unknown and so you know as leaders as citizens you know uh, these this is a point that we have to keep in mind funding you know fire chiefs or the politicians of those involved um, 
as leaders, you know, you can't promise that there will be major cost savings with these mergers, because there's generally no or very little savings of money in these efforts. But I think there's some key things that you have to keep in mind. The objective is to create efficiencies in the delivery of your emergency services. Number two, there may be some cost savings, uh, but more importantly, there are improvements in efficiencies of the merged department. departments. You can reduce your overhead, merge certain administrative and operational functions, uh, relocate stations or build new stations only uh, if needed in the response area, uh, purchase fewer apparatus, and actually you could hire uh, more personnel. I think it takes a sharp budget-minded individual and a lot of discussion to make this happen. So you know, obviously that's why we're here tonight to discuss these issues. Two other areas are culture. The culture is defined as the beliefs, customs of an organization. And I think in fire departments today, uh, the culture begins at the top of the organization and, and uh, hopes that it filters down and is reflective of the leader of that organization. And then the politics, the funding and the applicable uh, state statutes or laws uh, is the wholesome or successful uh, or, or is to be considered as far as the success of the merger. So, uh, the Ohio Revised Code, section I believe 505 of the code addresses the formation of fire districts, uh, their operations, and uh, associated uh, statutes. Um, you know, when it comes to putting together a fire district, uh, there's a lot of things that need to take consideration amongst the, the departments that are being considered as far as the merger. Uh, if you look at policies, operational directives, training, qualifications of the firefighters and officers, and there are many, many, many more details that have to be cons considered. Like I said, you know, the regionalization, the forming of the fire district, it's a very complicated process uh, that needs to be given consideration. Um, you know, the one department that, uh, that comes to mind is the BST and G fire district, just kind of north of um, Columbus. Uh, it's in the Sunbury area in Delaware County. Uh, it services Berkshire Township, mm -hmm. Sunbury, the city of Sunbury, <coughs> Trenton Township, and the village of Galena. Um, I spent a lot of time doing work with this department, and it mirrors uh, one of the more successful uh, fire districts. Uh, the area that they serve uh, was, and probably still is, considered one of the fastest growing areas uh, in the state. Uh, you know, the bottom line is, uh, formation of a fire district or regionalization is the efficiencies are found uh, in leaner, less top-heavy leadership, uh, consolidation of the resources, whether it's uh, the fire stations, whether it's the apparatus, uh, increased purchasing powers, uh, perhaps a larger revenue source, and the, and the ability to successfully pass levies or uh, bonds to support the operation of the district. You know, I will say in closing on this particular topic is consolidations and mergers are hard work and not all will be successful. I, can, you know, I can't say that, but if you are contemplating such a venture, uh, make sure you do your research, call upon other uh, departments or districts that have considered this, that have worked through this. Uh, Certainly, like I said, there are many departments out there that have successful uh, ventures, and unfortunately, there have been some departments that uh, have not been so successful. So, any questions at this point on regionalization? Yes, ma'am. If you could just hold that mic up right there. I'm sorry to be rude, but it's hard to hear you. Okay. Um, could you elaborate a little bit where you said funding cannot promise the cost savings and then it kind of trailed off and I couldn't hear what you said after that, and I'm so sorry. Well, that's, that's, a, that's okay. You know, um, I have found over the course of my career that uh, there's no sore thing as far as funding. 
you know, as time passes on, there's a cost increase in everything. Um, you know, I was the fire chief of a 180 person department. It was a combination department that staffed uh, using full time and part time personnel. And every year, you know, I had to fight uh, for, you know, for the budget. Uh, when I retired, I had a $15 million budget to, to manage uh, 80 full time personnel and 80 part time personnel. You know, with each year, the cost of uh, personnel costs go up, fuel costs go up, uh, you know, to actually do the maintenance and repairs on the station, there's just a, a whole list of things that, uh, that we see with increases. So, you know, it's, it's something that's going to be a battle throughout the duration of the operation. You know, and, you know funding, again, you know, at some point in time, that approved funding is going to expire. And then you have to go back to the citizens, at least in my case it was, being a township uh, former government. You know, I was very fortunate. Um, you know, I was raised in a department under leadership that was very conservative. And I carried that conservatism, <coughs> you know, throughout my career. Because, you know, I knew what the environment that I worked in. And uh, fortunately for myself and my department, uh, we were successful whenever we went to uh, to the citizens for a levy. Now, you know, the longest time we were able to extend a levy was 12 years. But that was through, again, conservative uh, leadership and just, uh, you know, very cognizant of how we conduct our business. So, but the savings that you were getting at by consolidating, you said you can't always promise that. Is that? Well, the savings themselves, again, uh, come through the consolidation efforts. Uh, you know, you're not duplicating resources. You know, uh, you know, if you've got three municipalities, you know, you don't need three ladder trucks. You know, you don't need maybe perhaps six pumpers. Uh, you know, you could perhaps reduce down to one ladder truck and three pumpers in frontline service, and maybe one or two pumpers in reserve. But, you know, those are where the cost savings come in. You know, uh, you know, you're not purchasing or duplicating efforts or resources uh, to operate the, uh, the district or the consolidated services. What metrics are you using to define a successful regionalization effort or an unsuccessful regionalization effort? Well, you know, the elements I, I discussed before um, as far as success and failure of the, uh, of the operation, Again, you know, through the formation of a, uh, a district, um, I don't know if I'm getting too far down into the weeds, uh, you know, the formation of the district requires representation from all the communities that are involved in, in the district. And uh, quite frankly, I've seen situations where uh, not all the representatives are on the same sheet of music, if you will, uh, there's a struggle for power, um, you know, and, and it's just a, it's, it's a constant battle. Uh, in a situation that was close to me down in my area of the state, uh, a district was formed, and eventually departments start falling off of the district. They wanted to go back and maintain their own autonomy, if you will, uh, just because of the. Um, lack of interaction or collaboration or cooperative um, climate uh, within within the board and the departments. So, yes, sir. What has been your experience in contractual agreements between communities over and above what's called for a mutual aid? For example, one community decides to act as a first responder in a section of the other community, back and forth, and no success rates in time frame compared to a special district. Well, uh, if you're referring to providing services under contract either to the entire community or a segment of the community, uh, in, in my community we provide contractual services uh, to a neighboring community simply from the standpoint that we could, uh, our, our station was closer 
to that neighborhood and say what their station was. Um, you know, I think uh, contracting services is a good approach to uh, enhanced service, if you will. So in my particular situation, uh, like I said, you know, our, our, our one fire station was closer to the neighborhood of the uh, neighboring community than what their fire stations was. You know, it was certainly cheaper for them to contract with us than to build a fire station, staff it, and then have all the other associated costs with having a fire station just to serve uh, one neighborhood or one segment of that community. So in the long run, it was uh, uh, cheaper. But, you know, as time goes on, again, you know, we had to go back and negotiate the contract because, you know, again, the cost of providing services goes up every year. Personnel costs, fuel, uh, apparatus maintenance, you know, those types of things. And, uh, you know, uh, let's face it, nothing's free in this world today. And, uh, you know, uh, we just want to make sure that uh, the citizens are served. But, you know, again, you know, we need to be compensated for our services. A follow-up question. If a community has a particular problem now, today, what might a problem that may be near five years and what they may be looking into the future. In your report for the um, the three communities, you indicated it was indicated that Northwood was adding full time employees now. But that in their their current structure was full time, part time in POC as as it is um, Lake Township. If Ross should start a program like that, would that actually be a component then of a special district looking at it in five years or so? In other words, if they met their needs today, the opportunities of a special district for looking beyond are still there, and that would be part of that base. I think that's what you was written in that report for the community. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about staffing here in my next uh, subject. Uh, but you know, when you refer to POC, it's uh, paid on call. Um, but you know, again, there's challenges with how fire departments are staffed. I mean, there are significant amounts of challenges. Um, you know, again, that's an elected official's uh, decision as to uh, what can the community afford or what can the district afford or what are they willing to to uh, pay you know and you know and, and, and some of the ownership falls back on the citizen you know um, what are you willing to approve as far as the type of fire protection how that fire protection is staffed and uh, you know those are tough topics and they're, they're, they're hard decisions to make <coughs> I guess to be, I wasn't quite clear. My question wasn't quite clear. Northwood is adding employees full time now. Okay. Um, it's mentioned in that report. Yes. But in the event if they order to enter into a special district with either Lake or Rochester or wherever, that would become part of. Would the same thing be true if Rochester? started full-time, part-time, along with the POC, to meet the immediate need for safety, but with the eye of what maybe three or four years down. A special district could take how long? Three or four years? If everything fell in? It, it could. It could. So if I understand your question, <coughs> asking, uh, just to kind of to condense what it is that you're asking, uh, do the members of Rossford or Lakewood become uh, employees of the district, is that what you're asking? Well, I know that. What I'm saying is, if Rosh had created their own, to start with, smaller full-time, with the part-time and the POC, could that be part of a special district? Absolutely, it could. Absolutely. Okay. So it's not a wasting money, but you are, if the numbers all work out, meeting an immediate <coughs> Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes,
as it relates to staffing uh, you know quite frankly uh, recruitment and, and retention of staff uh, it impacts the fire service not only statewide but across the nation you know uh, recruitment and retention is not something that's isolated in this area of the state you know everybody is impacted by it um, you know, for the longest time, recruitment and retention of volunteers was the only discussion that was taking place. But as of today, recruiting full-time, part-time, retaining full-time and part-time personnel is at the forefront of a lot of fire departments. Leadership's uh, uh, planning and uh, problems that you have to address. Uh, you know, there are a number of different factors that can be associated with uh, <laughs> the recruitment problems and the retention of uh, incumbent staffing. Uh, you know, as far as the fire service, you know, our call volumes are increasing every year. There's greater time demands on the firefighters and paramedics. And those demands can come from overtime requirements, training requirements, not only with, within the department, but at the state level to maintain their certifications. Aging communities, the demographics within the communities. You know, these are all draws on service, especially on the uh, emergency medical side of uh, the services that are provided. And then, you know, the physical risk of the occupations create further challenges uh, to fire departments that are struggling to maintain sufficient uh, staffing levels. Um, you know, again, looking back at my organization, um, my perception of our department was it was a revolving door. You know, we paid well. We made over 12,000 runs a year. You know, we had some of the, uh, in my opinion, some of the best equipment uh, and resources. Uh, but still, you know, uh, it was a revolving door. Folks would come to us, they would get experience, they would get the training, only for them to turn around, sometimes in six months, sometimes after several years, and turn around and leave. What I'm going to offer you right now is my opinion and my opinion only. And I think there's a lot of folks in the fire service as leaders that would agree with me. What we're seeing now is probably a result of some of the generational differences. And I'll be quite honest with you, is that uh, you know a lot of folks that are entering the fire service today, they want more money, less work, and time off. <laughs> that's 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 what we're observing today. There are a lot of good firefighters and paramedics out there, but uh, 
you know, we've seen the physical, we've seen the mental uh, results of the uh, run activity, the uh, divorce uh, and marriage failures as a result of uh, firefighters and paramedics being away from home. Uh, you know, the demands <coughs> are much greater than what they were 25, 30, 40 years ago. Um, you know, I can uh, recall when I first entered the fire service in our area, you know, it was firefighting, emergency medical services, and hazmat. You know, those were the three big areas of the services that uh, we, we provided. And of course, as I went through the course of my career, you know, we got more into community risk reduction, which is the fire prevention, public education, and code enforcement. Um, you know, along with those certifications comes <coughs> continuing education. Um, we got more into uh, incident management. As you move through the ranks and become fire officers, uh, you know, you're required to attend training and have continuing education in managing incidents. Uh, and, you know, and, the, and the list just goes on and goes on. Uh, I was very fortunate from the standpoint that my wife was very supportive of me uh, throughout my, through my career. You know, I lost time with my children that I'll never get back. And so, you know, today I spend a lot of time with my children and my grandchildren trying to make up for lost time. It's a very demanding job. It, it, it truly is. And, uh, but you know, still, as community leaders, you know, we are obligated to provide fire protection and public safety services to the citizen <coughs> businesses of our communities. Uh, from a leadership standpoint, you know, the creation of new initiatives to support the existing uh, uh, shortages of firefighters. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things that we need to look at. And I think some of the initiatives that have been explored or approached by many fire departments include uh, apprenticeship programs, cadets, fire explorers, uh, supplemental education <coughs> programs at the high schools and at the college level. Uh, you know, some fire departments have even gone as far as to do what they call lateral transfers to attract firefighters from other departments. And you know, these are just some of the initiatives that uh, fire departments and communities have gone to to try to increase their staffing. You know, I just recently learned in Pennsylvania here recently where there are incentives as far as the taxes are concerned for volunteer firefighters and firefighters, uh, housing incentives. I think at this point they're pulling out all the stops to, to try to attract people to the uh, firefighting profession. Looking at uh, recruitment, or, you know, there's, there's several, several things here that I think that negatively impact uh, recruitment. Again, this is not a statewide issue. This is not a regional issue. This is uh, across the board. There were times where cities especially larger cities, would offer a, uh, a hiring process in which hundreds of people would apply for the job at a chance of becoming a firefighter. Having served in this business for 40 years, it absolutely is the best job in the world, in my opinion. You know, uh, most career schedules, you know, you work one day and you're off two days. And, uh, you know, some departments even it's gone as far as you work one day and you're off three days. But you know, those 24 hours or those one day can be very <coughs> physically and mentally demanding. Not every day is like that, but there are some that, that certainly can be. And some of those demands and, and the effects of those demands can last a lifetime. In 2008, we lost two firefighters. And uh, some of my co-workers, you know, they're still affected by, you know, that event uh, to this day. <coughs> but, um, you know, as a 
prospective fire department employee, you know, I would think or would hope that you would do your homework. And I think a lot of uh, prospective uh, fire recruits do their homework. And, uh, you know, and considering whether or not to enter the service or uh, whether to, to pursue some other uh, type of uh, vocation, you know, some of the negative things that impact uh, recruitment is salary and benefits. Um, you know, depending on the size of the community, you know, uh, what's affordable? What's an affordable salary? And not every you know, fire department can afford to pay an entry-level firefighter seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars to enter the, enter the service. Um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, I was the chief of the combination fire department, and we started the part-time service back in the late nineteen eighties. We were the second fire department in the state to employ part-time firefighters and, and, and pay them hourly. And you know, I'm not ashamed to say I started off as a part-time employee. I was only being paid two dollars and one cents an hour. I was just happy to be a firefighter and have a job and be able to do what I set out to do as a, as a, as a young person. So over the years, the part-time system has started to fail. And uh, while I had an authorized strength of 35 personnel a day, we struggle every day to staff those fire stations and those fire <coughs> apparatus with personnel. So the decision was made to uh, move towards uh, more full-time staff. And over the course of a few years, I hired 35 personnel, but in doing so, uh, I had to work with the union, and in order to be able to afford the staff uh, additional full-time personnel, uh, I had to reduce the starting salaries for those new full-time personnel. And I knew over time that that was going to come back to bite us. And it did. Uh, of course, it happened after I left, but uh, that was through, again, the department being a revolving door, you know, a certain group of individuals that were making less money than the more tenured. So, you know, firefighters, you know, they came, they got their training, they got their experience, and they left and went someplace else where they were going to make more money. So, you know, salary and, you know, competitive salaries and benefits, you know, are, you know, is probably at the forefront of uh, those elements that impact uh, recruitment. The increased scope of work, I talked about that, you know. At one time, you know, being just a firefighter or just being a firefighter, emergency medical technician, uh, you know, those responsibilities exist no longer. Again, you know, fire safety inspectors, paramedics, uh, technical rescue specialists, uh, you know, the fire service wears a lot of hats. And you know, when the community has an emergency or a citizens in need, typically you know, the fire service is who they place their call to. So over the years, the scope of work for the uh, fire department has increased uh, twofold. I think as a uh, prospective fire recruit or new uh, employee to the fire department, you, know, you have to consider the health risk that you're exposed to. You know, firefighters uh, have greater uh, susceptibility to certain types of cancers, uh, you know, personal injury, and you know, um, you know, I think a you know, person they, they, they have to give that consideration. You know, is what they're doing uh, worth uh, <coughs> lifelong uh, problems or issues, as to, you know, uh, from what you were exposed to as a firefighter. Uh, work schedule and work hours, you know, while it sounds uh, intriguing to work, uh, you know, 24 hours or 48 hours off, um, I can tell you right now, there's lots and lots of overtime to be had just because of uh, the shortages that exist right now. 
trying to keep staffing levels at a safe level uh, with, within the ranks. Uh, you know, we as fire department administrators, you know, we have minimums that we like to see the trucks staffed with. So, uh, in order to do that, you know, we have to uh, we have to mandate or uh, require overtime. Uh, you know, what I'm seeing out of younger folks today is they want to come in, put their 24 hours in, and go home and spend time with their family. So, it's a challenge to even get uh, folks from overtime. I mentioned to you about changing different demographics and the aging population. You know, the EMS emergency medical services workload uh, continues to climb. You know, when I um, started in Coleman Township, you know, we didn't get anything as far as a nursing home. We had a retirement home for nuns, and when I left uh, the job, we had eight nursing home facilities within our community and uh, the existence of those care facilities really increased our, our workload. Uh, again, you know, looking at the aging community, uh, that required us to engage in some community risk reduction efforts where we tried to uh, initiate uh, fall prevention. Uh, we were doing more vital signs checks or wellness <coughs> checks on uh, the residents. Uh, but overall, again, from an emergency medical services perspective, you know, the workload uh, just continues to increase. You know, I think as far as younger people as well, you know, especially since COVID, uh, they have a different perspective on uh, vaccine mandates. You know, as emergency medical care providers and firefighters, you know, we're exposed to a lot of different environments. And uh, you know hepatitis, uh, obviously COVID. You know a lot of departments were requiring these vaccines, and I know some people just have different opinions or different uh, outlooks on being mandated to have these vaccines injected into their bodies. Because you know we don't know fully what the long-term effects are of uh, <coughs> these vaccines or medications in which they're put putting into our body. So, I mean, I guess lastly is the perception of fire ground and incident scene dangers. You know, obviously, whether you're a nurse medical provider or whether you're a firefighter, you know, there's going to be inherent dangers to the job, just like there is with uh, law enforcement work. Um, you know, no two incidents are ever the same. Like I said, you know, we lost two firefighters back in 2008. And it was a very routine call you know, when the initial call was, uh, came in. But within a matter of minutes, you know, we lost a full-time firefighter and we lost a part-time firefighter. And um, so, you know, like I said, for the person entering the fire service or giving a consideration, you know, I would hope that they would do their homework and it appears that a lot of them are because they're deciding, you know, to take a different avenue other than, uh, other than fire service. As far as retention of uh, incumbent staffing, you know, there's some uh, items or elements that the literature suggests for the reasons that incumbent uh, personnel are either changing occupations, choosing early retirement, or just uh, getting out of the business itself. Um, obviously, mentioned paying benefits, uh, the ability for the department or the community to uh, increase staffing or hiring, uh, the need or the want for better training, and even uh, leadership changes, you know. It seems that uh, the subordinate personnel or the firefighter personnel, you know, um, they're looking for leaders that are going to be supportive of them. I, again, I think this may be a generational uh, issue, but uh, you know, they're looking for leaders that are going to provide vision, recognize the dangers that they face, but they also want to be part of the decision-making process. So, um, <coughs> you know, 
training, you know. Mr. Cook, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Sure. If anyone has any additional questions for Mr. Cook. Just a follow-up question. Yeah. When you use the term part-time, are you interchanging that with the part-time on-call and the permanent part-time that we see in the area department? So probably, well, what I'm referring to is personnel that are on station, that are paid an hourly rate, but they're considered part-time. They're part-time from the standpoint, they're not paid benefits. So there is a difference between paid on call and part-time, and I apologize for not clarifying this one. Um, so when you have witnessed other groups coming together and consolidating, has there been a way to offer preferential hiring to those that are already with these departments when they're combining? Are they combining the resources of the firefighters that are already there? Um, like our situation could mean that people that have been rostered firefighters for a long time aren't necessarily a guarantee if we um, com come together with neighboring communities. So my experience has been that uh, in the formation of these consolidated services, uh, employees are absorbed into the district. Uh, again, getting back to the cultural environment that exists within the new uh, form district or agency, um, there are going to be people that just are totally against formation of the district and you know they're either going to stay and <coughs> tough it out or they're going to fight <laughs> you know against everything that's coming down the road um, or they're just going to leave and find some other means of employment or serving their community yes sir <coughs> out of the gate not down the road What's more cost effective for a community? To hire employees and run their own full-time department or to merge with the district? What is more cost effective for the community? You know, I, I, I will say that uh, providing fire protection services, it, it, it's a cost adventure. I understand and, that. You know, I'd like the startup I, cost, what is going to be the cheaper avenue to go? I, I can't tell you that right now. I, I just don't, you know, I have to see uh, the factors, and I'm not going to go out there and say that one way or another is going to be the most affordable way to do it. Uh, there's a lot of factors that have to be considered uh, as far as the community and uh, what resources exist. Uh, I just I just can't answer that uh, at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Uh, do you see a large difference in the creation of ambulance EMS districts compared to joint fire rescue districts? Is there a large difference in the process, the end result? Uh, well, um, the process is, is similar. I can tell you there, uh, there are very few ambulance or EMS districts. I mean, even though they do exist here in the state of Ohio, um, I just worked with a uh, ambulance district down in Hancock County, and uh, they really, really struggled to staff. Um, I think ambulance districts are uh, at a more disadvantage. Uh, again, I just don't think the resources are there. Um, I just talked to a fire chief today that uh, he was in one of the local community colleges that uh, provide paramedic uh, training. And it's at its lowest enrollment than it's ever been. But uh, you know, to answer your question, uh, the formation is, is similar. Again, they all fall under the same uh, state statute or state laws uh, as far as the operation of the, uh, the districts. But uh, and I hope that answers your questions. Is is the, you mentioned the paramedic enrollments down? I'm, I work in medical, so I understand the side yes. of the house and receive that one. But is that is the makeup then that you you see more of an, an enticement to bring people in if it's both firefighter and EMT 
firefighter, paramedic? Is there a better <coughs> law for that? Or better well, I think the majority of the uh, fire departments providing uh, what we call uh, EMS, uh, fire-based EMS, you know, uh, the departments that provide a basic service is very few and far between. Uh, most fire departments today are providing a advanced life support uh, transport service, although there could be some departments out there that have a separate entity that provides the advanced life support or the ALS. But uh, I think uh, there are uh, very few and far between uh, fire departments that uh, provide just a basic emergency medical services. Uh, the, ma the majority of the EMS that is provided by fire departments is all advanced life support. I think we have a question in the back. Yes, sir. Is there a specific fire association in the I agree with what they said. No. We all have to 
have to have a reason why we're doing this. Nineteen ninety eight. I was challenged. We were having staffing problems then. Do you know who established two part time people working eight hours a day, seven days a week? Me. We were the only department that did it for years. And then the next department. And then the next department. And then all of a sudden, everybody's working day shift because they were having personnel problems. 2001. My duties at Lucas County EMS became, they wanted me to do more in the city. And I was taking vacation time. I was taking personal time from my full-time job until I drew the line. I said, nope, you guys got to either get a full-time chief in here or I can't be the guy. If you look at the ordinance, and this is where all of you need to come in, open up the ordinance historical records. Feb either end of February or the beginning of 19... 2001, there was an ordinance establishing a full-time fire chief so that there was a paramedic in the city all the time. I didn't make them all, but they, 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 some of the people that here know that I made probably 75 to 85 percent of the calls on an annual basis. And when I didn't get up on the night that there was a call, I felt so damn guilty I couldn't even go to the firehouse. That's how guilty I felt. Look up that ordinance. It was to have a full-time fire chief at all times in this city. And some of you here and some of you that are gone in this audience, in this administration, I told you all there was a problem. I told you all there was a problem. I text messaged a lot of you, a lot of you. I told you we got a problem. You don't know what you're talking about, you're full of shit. What do you know? Guess what? Today's the day. All of a sudden we got a problem and shuffling all that under the door for all them years, guess what? It's today. How much? Now. Yes. I, what? You're at your five minutes. It's fine. I only have a few more points to make. I was told this is administrative chief. Let me tell you what. I challenge all of you to call all the fire departments in Northwest Ohio, Southeast Michigan. The chiefs are doing more of the work now. I made fifty thousand dollars when I became the full time chief. Now we're up to ninety-some thousand dollars, and we got Northwood Chiefs and Perrysburg Township Chiefs taking our calls. Why haven't anybody asked any questions? Why? Can't all just sit there. There's got to be a reason why. I'm going to go to the. I'm going to go to the. I'm going to go right now to the reason why we had a station two out in the crossroads. <laughs> And I don't have a problem with them giving the property away because back in the day, there was no plan on building a fire station. Roster kept going to the commissioners, and y'all can check this into the public record, nobody seems to know. If you go to the, the township trustees and township people will go to the commissioners meeting saying these guys can't provide protection to this area. And we were providing protection to the area, honestly. So the commissioner said, we're not granting any more annexes until you guys do something about a fire station out in the South District. I listened to all the meetings online. Like I said, I'm scared to come talk because I fear if someone's going to retaliate for me. And I know it's probably going to happen. But I've been biting my tongue too long. So what did Rosper do? We had, I've heard, fire station meetings couple council meetings ago where nobody seemed to know anything about a fire station. Well, guess what? We contracted with Polar Meyer Design in Bowling Green. There's several fire stations and they weren't anywhere near 
the cost of what I heard on the, on the uh, online meeting. Somebody make a phone call to Bogemeyer. It's all right there. The ordinance is how much we pay them, what the fire station looked like, what the cost. Obviously that cost isn't nowhere near where it needs to be now. But we went through all that. Guess what? There was never an intention to ever build a fire station out the crossroads. It was so we could keep getting annexations. Check the record. It's, it's honest to God fact. Again, I've, I've attempted, I'm not naming any names tonight. Some people up here, I contacted five times after the election. I want to meet with you, just to give you my perspective of what I know. You know what I was told? I don't have time to meet with you more than one time. But they're all available tonight, tip two. They're all available tonight to meet with you. Okay. I keep hearing it's, it's too late. We gotta get this done right now. No, we don't. This has been going on for six years. And now all of a sudden, we gotta get it done now? The two count, new council members, you guys need, you guys aren't even up to speed on anything. Not, no disrespect. But that was why I made the point that I did that I'm not in a position to make a decision. And do you think do you think I, you're I comfortable want to be voting too? That when did you contact me? I have contacted you. I, the people that con I, I contacted you, you know, I contacted clear that it was yeah. zero for me. I have, I didn't say I contacted you. <clears throat> this is a decision that's historical. 1915, the department was established. I self-taught myself how to write grants. I'm proud to say that I established the fire prevention program in this city in 1992. I'm proud of the fact that I went down to Bowling Green and taught myself how, how, to, how to figure out what a tax evaluation is and how to go to the auditor and, 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 go and, and learn how to do a millage. The only ordinance I, or the only mill, the levy that I didn't get passed was for the new fire truck, the new ladder truck million bucks. Our current one was 1977 and it was old and it was tired and out of standard. Brings me to my last point. Okay, you got 20 seconds. You got it. I was told that that's Jimmy's, Jimmy's ladder truck. That's what I was told was said by the chief at, at the safety committee meeting. Well, we bought that fire truck we needed a replacement for what we got, and guess what? We got that truck, and it was only supposed to be for a short period, not as long as it lasted now. And for that, Josh, I'm sorry, I'm singling you out. I, I taught you, I mentored you. You were so excited, you put me under the bus at that meeting. You were so excited, you had to drive the thing all the way home from Columbus. But it was a piece of crap. Do your homework. Thanks for the reminder on the Cody Meyer Fire Station designs. We'll look into that. Um, I know that the cost put, in, put into that option number was um, not based on an official design, just based on a, another fire station for a community our size. Um, Mr. Segura provided other examples of fire stations that are less costly. So that certainly counts radar to explore less costly. Um, options for a fire station and um, I think that's definitely something we're all we're all considering and conscious of the cost of that. Anyone else? Go ahead. Pam O'Neill. Pam O'Neill, 944 Orchard Drive. Um, I just have two questions, very basic questions, but there are probably a lot of people who don't know the answers to that. Um, the first one is, I thought, I've been in the area here for at least 30 years, and I thought many years ago that we voted and passed some kind of an emergency service that was supposed to be full-time permanent. And then 
that never happened. I don't understand what happened to that. It was even brought up while people were running for office recently, and I remember that same situation where I voted for something that I thought was in regards to some kind of a full EMS, which I felt was very important, uh, particularly to the older citizens in town. I think I think that was for um, a daytime EMS shift, <coughs> a full-time daytime EMS shift, so like an eight-hour one shift of full-time EMS staff. So that follows on my second question, and I know this just um, may be naive of me, but I don't know what coverage we do have. Could somebody please explain what our fire and emergency services coverage is in Rossford? Um, because I keep seeing stuff on Facebook about there's nobody in attendance at the fire station on particular hours or particular days. And I don't think we can figure out where we need to go from here if people don't even understand what we currently have. Sure, there's been a lot of misinformation on Facebook. Allison or Josh, can you speak to that? September of 2020, we had two people in the station on the day shift. That's 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. In September, I know that Caroline Eckel and the safety committee worked with me and the mayor, and we used COVID money to begin with for three months to see does it make sense to shift to staff the overnight shift with two additional people. Ever since September of 2020, we have had in the budget to be staffed two people on days, two people on nights, and four people on days, and four people on nights for on call. The problem is not that we don't budget for people to be in the station. The problem is that we can't get enough people, and the people that we have have full-time jobs elsewhere, and so we can't get those spots covered. How many of those people are full-time here? We don't have any full-time uh, except for Chief. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. Pam, did you have anything else? That was it. Thank you. Yep. Jenny? Jenny Hill, 109 Homestead Drive. Hello? Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello? It'll kick you. Okay. So, Jenny Hill, 109 Homestead Drive, Rossford, Ohio. Uh, those shifts are covered with volunteers. Yes, they have the money budgeted for it, but until you get the volunteers, <coughs> you will not be staffed. That's why you see things saying that it's not staffed. The problem is, like she said, I don't know any firefighters personally that don't have another gig somewhere or have to have a full-time job. My husband was on the fire department here for quite a number of years himself. And the only calls that he didn't make were middle of the night sometimes because he had to go to his full-time commitment, the one that paid his benefits, the one that put food on our table. This wasn't, he would have loved to do this full-time, but you can't raise a family typically on that. And the men and women you see in this room and the men and women that serve our city and many others, they're not doing it for the money. And to suggest that, oh, kids don't want to do it because they're lazy or they just want a little bit of work and a little bit of pay, those are the wrong kids. Because it takes a special type of person and a special type of person with hopefully that support system around them to be able to do this job, to be willing to do this job, and to be doing it for as many years as a lot of these people have been because I know they were on the department, a lot of them, where my husband was. This isn't easy. And for all the reasons he mentioned before, to me, that's just a, another reason that city council should be digging deep and giving them the best pay, the best benefits, and the best chance that we have because they are putting their lives on the line. They are putting their future health at risk. They're putting a lot of things out there. They're giving up time with their families. And in my opinion, we've got a great city. You're doing a lot for development. 
You've done a lot with the police department. We've got a great police department. We've got excellent schools. In my opinion, you've neglected this department. I was here three years ago and told you guys before Amazon and the senior housing was built, we have a problem already. This is going to compound it. I was told, nope, don't worry about it. We'll hardly ever be out there. Do you really think we're hardly ever out there daily, sometimes multiple times a day? Yes, it creates a strain. Rossford deserves a full-time department, and they deserve to think outside the box and figure out how to give those people that life-work balance and make it attractive, because a lot of these people came here to begin with because of the department we had at one time and where they could go. And the, the volunteer standard doesn't work anymore because they have full-time jobs. Until we make this job someone's priority and can pay their bills, put food on their table, and supply you know, health care and that, it's going to continue to be their part-time gig. And that's not going to change with the regional, that's not going to change with contracting, unless a different model is put forward. And let's go one step further and think outside the box again. You go ahead and have your full-time. And right now, you have to be EMS and five, so medical and five. You guys might be missing out on some other potential people to show up for EMS calls, which is the vast majority of Rossford's calls is EMS. <coughs> there are people that might be willing to show up for calls if they didn't have to have that fire requirement on them. I'm not going to speak for my husband, but to use him as an example, my husband who doesn't feel like he can compete in the fire realm anymore, humping hoses and putting him putting somebody else at risk because of his age and size is still perfectly capable of saving a life and triaging someone and getting them to the hospital in time. And somebody like him may be inclined to help out or show up for those calls. I've been approached by several people that said they would do EMS only as well. And, and that, that they, it, it maybe it's a volunteer basis for those people, just like you have volunteer basis for now. Obviously, you may not want to staff with those people because they may have to, you may have a fire in the middle of the day. And I also want to ask you another question. Do we have a boat to respond to emergencies on our portion of the river that we are supposed to respond to? Uh, no. I don't think so. Okay, so first off, I'm a little concerned that nobody on council seems to know the exact answer. That well, we had one that we were borrowing from another department, and I don't know if we're still borrowing it, so we don't own one. Was it like a John boat that would be dangerous to get anybody in on the side and yes. probably capsize with one or two people if you had a rescue? So I take a little bit of issue with you guys continuing to tell us that safety is your number one priority when we haven't had a viable rescue boat for the portion of the river we're responsible for since, what, 2019? Maybe 20, I'm not sure. Because my husband was on the last boat we did have when the steering went out. It was decommissioned because it was too expensive to replace. And they haven't replaced it yet. And and if you're so concerned with safety, there there's another gaping hole in our safety. Because we have a marina. We are a safe harbor. We have no way to respond to water rescue. I, I'm, I'm frustrated, obviously. This has been a long time coming. And, and the last thing I want, like I said, I, I believe that they've been pushed aside. It doesn't matter how much money you throw at them. I mean, who's not going to take money if you offer it? They're asking for the basic, you know, they want to just support their same families, a work-life balance. They want to make this their first priority. And if you guys do go to some other system, whether it be contracting or regional, I, I implore you to write into that contract or that decision that every one of the men and women on our, on our department now have a job if they want one. Now, you can add... They should have a job if they want one and with a 90-day probationary period or something else. You know, if something's not working, it doesn't work. But every one of these people should have the right to a job going forward with the, what they've already given us. Thank you. Okay, I want to make a quick comment on the man power coverage that Allison explains. Um, when we have shifts that are not filled by our Rossford 
staff, um, Allison goes and offers the shifts to the surrounding communities to make sure that we do have firefighters in the station. So that's been going on. Um, and that's an additional thing to mutual aid. We have mutual aid, but, but this is an additional, it's, it's planned, <coughs> so to speak. And so there has been coverage. It just might not be rostered people. Um, so we, that's kind of a, a stop the bleeding situation that we're just doing the the response about? They're at the Rossford station. North, no, they're not. North Lauder is not at the station. It's more misinformation. Go ahead. Henry Roach, 1220 for SE. Currently, how much do we pay out to our other mutual cities that help respond to the city's budget? Allison or Chris? Um, right now, I would say we probably, well, when we were contracting with Only ten thousand. Anything to Perrysburg? No, just so there was information circulating around for eighty-one thousand in Northwood for twenty twenty-four. That was built. That was the ten thousand dollars a month. Okay. Back to fire. Based upon your runs and our population, to staff full time, and we'll just start at a minimum full time. How many personnel would be perfect? We have uh, one, so we're questioning until... You're going to talk about that one. Love to answer your question. The other question I have is, since we're talking about possible additional tax money, um, has anyone on this board potentially approached the school boards, because the schools are on such um, plus budgets right now, if there's any of those potential school levies that could be reduced or removed for the taxpayers to maybe go, you know what, we'll approve another one, if it's an offset cost from another place because of how heavily that budget is. We haven't talked to the school board, but we have tossed around the idea of instead of having property tax levies, we would raise, raise the payroll income tax to fund fire, park, fire department improvements, which would spread out the cost to the people who are working at Amazon and places like that, and it would lessen the burden on the homeowners. <laughs> And it would also lessen the burden on um, people on a fixed income. May I just suggest that you guys reach out to your school board and talk to them about possibilities of being able to possibly lower one to help the other. Yes. It's there. Andrew Vassett, 1124 Lewis Street, or Avenue, depending on what you have on your map. Oh, you got those for them? Perfect. Thank you, Chris. All right, a little background on me. Been on the fire service since uh, 2001, when the university gave me a chance when I was a high school senior. I've been hitting the, hitting the, hitting the ground running since then. I am currently working for a uh, full-time combination fire department at Springfield Township where I'm probably, it has accepted an acting battalion chief role to uh, manage the shift on our ABCD rotation. So that would be a 24-hour, 72-hour off rotation. Uh, circling back to some of the questions, Mr. Denzik, paramedic class, <laughs> you're looking at 18 to 24 months of commitment with no guarantee of passing one of the hardest tests you'd ever take in your life. That's why people do not want to get in that program. Young firefighters, they're different, yes. They want to be emotionally supported. They want to have good, consistent leadership. They want to be driven and shown and held their hands as much as it's hard, it's hard to say that you have to hold their hands and be like a dad to the young firefighters. They're out there, you need the right type A personality for that. Reason why people aren't testing? Most uh, fire, most uh, jurisdictions now have gone to a nas national testing center where it costs you $200 to test. $200 not to get a job. 
before what it used to be, even not for free. All right. Well, what I passed out here is the rostered firefighters bridging the gap, crossing the, coming across the street, giving you the exact, or a proposal for staffing. Background on the staffing. In the past five years, the fire department has increased their run volume by 25%. In my 22-year career, 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 it's gone up 48.75%. On average, for the last five years, 73.5% of those calls for service are EMS, with 26.2% of them being fire related. Out of that, 72 or 75 73.5 percent 27 percent are in the south district involving amazon and the senior living center we are proposing for a combination fire department a full-time part-time on-call volunteer full-time staffing could be a multitude of uh, options we can staff with Six, six full-time firefighters with three officers and a full-time fire chief. So that's 10, 10 full-time personnel and a combination of however we want to do this. Or my recommendation would be eight firefighters, four line officers, one full-time fire chief for a total of 13 full-time firefighters. The state of Ohio states that a full-time firefighter needs to be a level two certification firefighter. That certification has to be met within one year of employment. You can see the breakdown of the cost per firefighter paramedic, per officer, and per your chief. Having six line members, three firefighter, three officers, and one fire chief, $1.2 million. Eight line members, Four, four officers, one chief, $1.56 million. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. For those of us who don't know how their shifts work, can you just explain that quickly? Like with the six person model? Sure. I'll get to that. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, it's quite all right. <laughs> very, very good question. We you follow that staffing and supplement them with a part time staffing of three personnel of a combination of whatever fire level one or two for state of Ohio. If you're a part-time firefighter, you're either a level one or a level two. It doesn't matter. With the EMT, advanced EMT or paramedic certification rate. They'll be on uh, 24 hours. Uh, you can see the breakdown cost there of an EMT, $24, advanced EMT, 26, paramedic, 28, and then you retain a part-time fire chief, assistant fire chief at $38 an hour. The three three part-time firefighters would cost $735,840, with the part-time fire chief costing $49,400. The call staffing will remain, increasing it by one person, so you have three shifts in the morning and three shifts at night, so three personnel on call 24 hours. Estimated cost of that is $525,600. In 2023, only 18,000, or 1,878, correction, on my talking, $1,876.75, it's not dollars, it's hours, sorry. $1,876.75. was occupied by on-call staff. Dramatic increase needed there. Volunteer staffing would remain. Wages on wages would mer mirror the part-time wages. <coughs> Unable to calculate that due to the amount of time they would come in on general alarms and recalls. <coughs> Option one, with a staffing of six line firefighters, three officers, fire chief, part-time assistant chief, three part-time members on call, 2.5 million. You add four more firefighters and one more, or two more firefighters and one more uh, officer, that increases your operating budget for staffing to 2.8 million. 
Now, getting back to your question, Ms. Ms. Apple, staffing model, you would leave in staff, the medic unit with two personnel. Make sure that there is a paramedic firefighter on that. Make sure there's a firefighter EMT or another firefighter paramedic. The engine would consist of the fire officer and the three part-time firefighters. On call would be the three would be three firefighters with any EMS certification. I'm sorry to interrupt. Does that 2.8 million include benefits? 2.8 million include benefits, include benefits for for all the full-time staff. Yes, it does. You can see the breakdown on page one. All right, so you should be paid, yep, page one. Yep. Further breakdown, uh, broke down here, we, we did some uh, tough negotiation here on, within, amongst ourselves about how we would handle a potential first call and a second call. You can see there that, uh, for example, an EMS call, you get a medic unit and an engine. Medical alarm or assist somebody that fell, you get the fire engine. They wait, the, the medic unit's in service for the fire, for the uh, EMS call that may come in. And so on with structure fires, fire alarms and such, and whatnot's there. This would allow us to be able to handle a second call for service or even a third call for service where right now we are struggling to manage the first call for service. Thoughts for the future is we could, once we get up and running and spun up, look for and seek out those fire, those person, people that are EM, awesome EMTs, awesome advanced EMTs, and awesome paramedics that don't want to fight fire. There's an opportunity there. Absolutely. I would welcome all of them. You need to realize that the fire station, no matter what we do, is not conducive to 24 hour staffing. Limited kitchen space, a uh, group dormitory room, where the uh, now st new standard for dormitory is single dorms, separate showers, shower rooms for men and women, including a locker room, workout facilities, a training room, administrative offices, adequate quick kitchen for all, st uh, all shifts, an adequate base space, and most importantly, the ability to have our gear separated from our apparatus in our living areas. We talk a lot about the second station. Right now, I don't think we need one. But maybe in the future, we should plan for maybe a centralized station. I bring up the... Uh, area on Buck, Buck Road, on, or Buck and Glenwood Road, south of Buck, would be a great state area for a centralized station to reduce our time to the South District and to reduce our time with trains blocking the railroad tracks where we can efficiently get on to 75 northbound and get off at either Wales Road or Miami Street to come back into the town. That's all I have. So the centralized station would be, instead of having a second fire station, it would just be one? That, that could be an option. Okay. I'm not opposed to having a second fire station. With the second fire station, how would you handle the apparatus though? Would you need double everything? We already have double everything. We already have two medicaments. We already have two engines. The only thing we do not have is a uh, ladder truck. Right, okay. So you would just front home. So That's correct. And how would that affect the second station? How would that affect the staffing? But so we're staffing, we're staffing, in the model we're staffing six. Okay. So you put three up downtown, and you put three up down in the crossroads. Okay. And on here when you say um, three part-time line members, so does that suggest you only have three part-time members? Or? No, that's three part-time members per shift. Per shift. So in a 24-hour period, you're getting three people okay. part-time. Okay. So that could be unlimited. Correct. And um, you mentioned having just EMS. Correct. Which is that uh, 
your personal feeling or is that a general consensus of the department? It's a little secret in the fire service. Nobody got in the fire service to answer EMS calls. Gotcha. It's a fire department for a reason, man. Gotcha. Um, and I, you all put this together together? Yes, cooperatively. Any other thoughts on what like? You mentioned our <coughs> current station is not equipped for full-time staffing. If the two-station system that you described, what would have to be further done to ours? Just further, say, further whole, done to ours? I yeah. would be brutally honest with you, and I told Ms. Mayor McKenna when I took this acting position as the assistant chief that I'm not going to hold any punches. We need a bulldozer. Is the location acceptable? The location is acceptable, yes. Because it's not the only thing in that building. Correct. We can also make, if we did a general or a centralized station, we would piece with us and make it a true public service station. Which reality would make more sense to have Correct. one station that covers everything. Anyone else have counsel before I open up to the audience? You want to take questions from the audience? Sure. Have I will have take any questions that anybody might have. Yes, sir. 27 percent with Amazon in the uh, the uh, retirement facility uh, apartment senior living center. Uh, no, but we need that numbers for you. Absolutely. Yes. In your opinion, is it essential to have a ladder truck to serve our community? My personal opinion, yes, because I like ladder trucks. But no, uh, <laughs> we, we are we are surrounded by 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 ladder trucks. Um, I will be honest with you that us not having a ladder truck and us having the ladder truck the last time we were evaluated for your insurance with your ISO, we need to have a ladder truck. Here. Everyone's going to take a good hit on their insurance when we get reevaluated. So what, what she made the comment was, uh, we used to be, when we had that in service, we used to be one of two agencies that Toledo Fire would call to fill in at fire station when they had major incidents. Chief, I just want to say, you guys did your homework and I appreciate that. I got on the fire department and everybody said, you're not going to get thankful for anything you do. So thank you for this and I personally do some Departments is Perrysburg Township uh, has a 105 foot ladder truck. Okay. Northwood has a 110 foot ladder truck. Lake Township has a 75 foot ladder. Perrysburg City has a 110, 107 foot ladder truck. Toledo has three staff ladder trucks. That was my next question. Maumee has a 100 foot ladder truck. So, how big square footage is Toledo that they only have three ladders? I don't yeah. have those answers unless okay. Chris has that. Uh, uh, your uh, response area total for Toledo Fire. <coughs> yeah, and how and there's only three ladder trucks for this this area. Okay. And so with us not having the ISO for the insurance side of it, we're not going to get any credit whatsoever because everybody in the neighboring area has a ladder truck. Correct me if I'm wrong. You are absolutely correct. We will not have that due to the way the ISO states that if we are using those ladder trucks as a mutual aid ladder company, the fire department, as in Rossford Fire, would have to train on all of those fire apparatus to be familiar with them and to be able to use those if the need arises. Uh, one one follow up real quick. So if it's a joint district, it's within the district. You're cross-trained with the joint district. Correct. Okay. Um, 
quick question on some of the breakdowns on the fire versus rescue call. Does that include rescue uh, injury accident? Is that under fire? Is that under rescue? Is that a higher? Yeah, so uh, accidents are uh, under the EMS portion of all of that. Okay. Okay. And that's that's uh, uh, by the state. It's yeah. either. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, it's all about it's all about reporting numbers. So all about reporting numbers. Yeah. As long as we get good data in, we can get you all of your data out. Yeah, and I want to. I know Jim Verbosky is involved. Great job of pulling this all together. You guys have done some work and you're working this. It's a fantastic job on that. Um, do you have limitations uh, in terms of what you have to roll out to a call? Do you have limitations that are based on state <laughs> law, statute, uh, recommended practices? We only have limitations on the bodies we put in the trick. Okay. The trucks. Okay. So, if, like, whether I, I checked within Ohio, there's some places that have gone to like fast response units, or right. they're yeah, you know, it's, it's meeting it's basically to, to meet staffing needs, right? That's, staffing that's availability. To get, that's to get um, people to your scenes quicker, yep. and that's also going to reduce the cost of yep. wear and tear on the bigger trucks. Yeah, you're not, you're not rolling a rig out there. You're rolling right. the you're guys. Roll, you're rolling a pickup truck. Yeah, pick kind of top of on He's out the door. And he's gone. He gets right the so there's no state requirement saying this. Nope. Thank you. Yes. What would be an advantage of Rossford having what you've laid out here from a full-time standpoint compared to somebody with, say, full-time fire and bowling green or Toledo? Would you think that we would actually get people that would want to come here based on? I believe we would. I believe with strong leadership, goal-oriented, people-driven, managed manage well, I think the people would come. With uh, the compound on that, with you know, say we hypothetically put this into practice or we decide this is what we want to do, how many people from the current department do you think would step up for the the full time positions? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Good to know. Thank you. Also, that is only if they pass the test. Because we have to silver, be civil service and make sure they pass the test. Anyone else have any questions? Thank you so much. This is very impressive. Thank you. service personnel, our fire department. Uh, I think they are very technically sound and proficient as responders. I once had a medical incident in my own home for which they responded within four minutes. I also had a cardiac arrest that virtually died in a restaurant in downtown Toledo. And a member of the department who was working there at the restaurant jumped on me, gave me CPR, saved my life. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate what the fire department has done over the years. Um, so I guess the whole thing is, is in recent months, I've sat at my sunroom window uh, in my home, which happens to just be right up in front of the colony. So at the colony gates, I can see every person that, and every event that goes on in the colony. They come through the colony gates. And there's only one way in and one way out. 
<laughs> and um, I, I think a lot of these folks have responded to many calls back then. The one thing that I have noticed, though, is that in recent times, I don't see the Rossford Fire and Rescue coming through those gates. I see Northport. I see Harrisburg Townships. And I guess I've tried to understand why that is. Maybe tonight we heard some of the reasons. <laughs> but I look back at my own personal experiences and try to put together um, this issue in the right perspective. When I first entered the Army in the 82nd Airborne Division during the Vietnam War, our mission was to serve as the nation's strategic reaction force. We would respond to any security emergency that occurred throughout the world. On a smaller scale, the mission of the Rossford Fire and Rescue is much the same. It's to respond to these emergencies that occur within our community with a highly trained group of personnel. You know, I never met a soldier in the 82nd Airborne that didn't believe that the accomplishment of our mission, which is basically to secure the security of our country, didn't override all other considerations. And, you know, sometimes I've, I've listened to members of the fire department, and I see that some of the men and women with, who are there actually don't place that as their highest priority, which I would say um, I have to question. I think in some cases it's more of what immediately their needs are and their individual desires. You know, as a business owner for 20 years, I employed members of the UAW, so I'm familiar with the union, and I enjoyed a great, a great relationship with the management of the UAW. Recently in the roster, the union negotiation process has failed us to some degree. Um, I was always able to come up with a mutually beneficial plan that required give and take on both sides. Uh, this needs to happen, or should have happened long before now in Rossford. Also, I have bought and sold businesses, all to the satisfaction of my employees. And in all cases, it required that personnel, including myself, had to reapply for a, at the acquiring company. This is much the same process as the department personnel may have to go through <coughs> under the options being discussed right now. I have learned that the larger the company, the more opportunities employees have. If our firemen could obtain more job security, more opportunities for advancement, and higher salaries, why wouldn't they want to jump on board and be involved in this process right now? Now, and the process of contracting services is actually the backbone of many businesses. And it's not just here, it's throughout the country. I had engineering projects going in 44 states, and I found that the only way I could do that was to subcontract services to the local companies. Well, they could perform actually better because they were there at a much lower cost and they would still provide the quality services that are needed. I'm convinced this would also happen if a Perrysburg Township agreement could be reached. Thus, I believe that contracting with Perrysburg Township provides the best plan of action and can be enacted in the shortest period of time at the least cost with minimal disruption. And council must realize that their top priority is to provide safety services for our community. And currently, there is too much uncertainty that exists in the department to actually be able to ensure that those responses that we need. So I strongly encourage that council approve an agreement with Perrysburg Township as soon as possible. And I guess I gotta step back and also say I don't know how many of you read the paper this morning, but I read the paper every morning, it's late. And there's a huge announcement in there about what's going on between the Rossford 
Police Department and the Perrysburg Township Police Department. They have joined hands in, in a cooperative agreement to support each other far beyond what mutual aid is. It actually is going to mean that they're going to work together for the security of both the township and Rossi. That same thing could be happening, and it might be, and should be happening with our fire and rescue services. And I also remind everybody that we all are part of the Rossford School District. And what comprises that school district is the township and the city. Again, that relationship is well established. So the obvious answer in my mind is to come up with this agreement with Perrysburg Township. <coughs> Thank you. Can you take questions? Can you take questions? Yeah, question. no, go ahead. So, so you, you, you think that it would be beneficial for Rossford to, to uh, coordinate with Perrysburg Township and let them take their services? So you said you were a business owner, all right? And you think that people need to retest the potential. So let, let me give you my thoughts. Probably well, come on up here and give them. Yeah, uh, yeah. come on and give your thoughts. Don't, don't, don't question him. So, real quick, so back when you were a kid, and you know, back way back, you know, things were a lot cheaper. And when I was a kid, you'd go to the store and buy a gallon of milk for 80 cents, and now it's three bucks and three loaves of uh, uh, bread for a buck. <laughs> and for Bosky's. Market, market, yeah, but, but baloney for 25 cents a pound. I remember the days walked up there. But so my point that I'm getting to you is the 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 $1 million dollars we're going to give somebody else put in your own city. You know, that's my point. So you know, you're going to everybody wants to farm out, farm out, farm out, farm out. That's everybody's answer. You know, I worked in the industry for 36 years. I'm an educator now. I kept my employees. You just don't get rid of people. So you take somebody that's got 25 years in service that take We're not getting rid of them. That's no, 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 no. So let me help you out. Okay, 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 so basically how it works in Perrysburg Township, if you're at the age of 50 years old, guess what? You don't get hired. You don't get hired. They got an age limit. Did they tell you that? Absolutely not. Age limit. So you got people back there, 50s, bye-bye. 22 years, bye-bye. Did you tell your employees that? Hell no, you didn't. Oh, I absolutely you, did. Well, I told him every restriction. That's why you live in the facility. Mr. O'Connor, please discuss council. Are we in court? Can you discuss council? Mr. Mueller, I'm not afraid to speak my mind, sir. Well, he's not you in the You know, the other question, I mean, you know, excuse me, Mr. Mueller, I'm sorry. 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 Mr. Mue
We have Northwest Water and Sewer in, in Rasford for water in, in you know sewer bill, 250 every time you flush your toilet at home. That's how it works. It's expensive. All right. School levy. We passed all that to levy. We all grew the school. All right. So we got all this money went out for taxes. Let the taxpayers make the vote. I honestly think it's a taxpayer's decision. I do. So I think that you know you guys should seriously look at that and not be the guys that are, have to make the decision of what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. Why sell the city out? For, why are you going to pay Northwood eighty thousand dollars, sixty thousand dollars in a year, or six months or five months, or pay Perrysburg Township one point two or three, four or five million dollars to cover our services when they don't even want to come here? They, you, I mean, I won't pay attention to social media anymore. I just got off that as I just get sick of looking at it. But my point is, is this. You're going to give them the money. Keep the money in your own town. Use your own money. Let the taxpayers make the decision. That's what it should be. There should be a levy. And if the levy passes, the people that work there full-time, part-time now, then they keep their jobs and they can fill in as they need them. That's what needs to happen. But everybody wants to make the decision. Let the people that pay these people's wages and taxes in this town make the decision. Now, I get tired of hearing all these war stories and all this garbage. You know what? Here it is. The bottom line is, is if you're going to displace people because they've got something better, but these people cry out there that we asked all this property. You know, somebody told me a long time ago there's never going to be a fire station out there. We just gave that property away. Just gave it away. I see plans for the fire department that Mr. Rubowski was talking about. They gave that away too. That just disappeared. The bottom line is if there was a levy that approved that, where's the money? Somebody has to have an answer to that. And if you recall back on candidate night, Mr. Stasek made a comment that his goal was to find out what happened to the money that the taxpayers had. Don't hear any more about that. Too much under the rug pushing in this city. I've lived here 63 years. It's, it's, it's got to stop. It's time for the taxpayers to have a voice, to make a decision, to let us, who has to pay for this, make the decision of what we're going to do with our own fire department. Mr. McKinnon, not throwing him out, I grew up across the street from this individual. January's here and gone, and we're, we're still here. Here we are in February, almost Valentine's Day, I don't need candy, you know, so don't get me any. Um, but I'm saying February's here, and we still don't have a decision. We have to have this kind of meeting, you got to have the media here, the blades here, everybody's here to write about this. We're the hot top, and what are we doing? Nothing. But the taxpayers make the decision. Thanks for your time, guys. Thank you, Mr. Nancy. Hi, uh, Bob Densick, 107 Birch Drive. Um, I don't really have a, I have a dog in this fight only in the sense that I'm a citizen, uh, just as everyone else in this room is. When it comes down to it, as, as everyone stated here up front here, public safety is number one. Always should be, always has been, always should be above everything else. And as the dollars come into the, citizen, to the city, to the coffers from the taxpayers, those dollars should go out on that basis, on that basis of priority. Public safety, number one, roads, number two. Everything else falls behind that. So let's keep that focus in mind as well. In the end, with public safety, if, just pick a wild example, say I fall off a ladder putting up Christmas lights, something strange <laughs> like that. I don't care whose name is on the badge. What I care about is the dedicated person, well-trained, committed to their staff, caring and focused. And I know that we have members back here who are exactly that. There are members at Northwood, there are members at Perrysburg, there are members at Lake, members at Toledo. They are that as well. I don't care what the name on their badge is. What I care about is, are they going to be here? Are they going to respond? Are they going to do it in an effective and efficient manner? You still have a taxpayer component here. How do we do this effectively and efficiently? I think the work that is done by the department here, the team members, is very good and very useful for you. You have a fun job. I sat in those chairs. I know how much fun of a job you have. Thank you, taxpayers, by the way, for not voting me for me again. Thank you. <laughs> Seriously, I love the service, I love the time, I love the time, and I love the work in the committees here. The committee structure is where this belongs right now and with the City Council. Carolina, I know how hard you've worked on this within the Safety Committee for many, many years. Don't forget your facilities, parks, and marina committees as well. There is a facilities component to this as well. We talked many years previously about getting public works out of that space. <coughs> 
the building is it doesn't need a bulldozer. I'm an architect, so it's pretty damn ugly, but there are things to be worked with within that. There's solutions, but you have to compare that versus what does it cost to go to a central <coughs> station just for the Rossford solution. If you start looking at other uh, other joint districts, what is new about that one? There are facilities components to it. There are staffing costs to it. There's a lot there to it. I know you have a lot of work on your plate ahead of you. I'm just encouraging you to do your homework, talk to the people around as well, keep safety first. Don't worry about the fiefdoms, don't worry about the names. Analyze, if I discover the issues, find possible solutions. They can be multiple. It's not, this is not a one size fits all solution. This could be this could be rescue, this could be advanced life support, this could be fire, this could be joint district, this could be rostered full time. There are a lot of options that are out there available. It may be multiple components of each of those. It's not a one size fits all solution. That usually means a bad fit. I think every, some of the guys out here, here I know we're talking about this one, those one size fits all shirts, can't, they don't fit some of us. One size all fits all solutions will not always work for all this one. Analyze every option, so thank you. Thanks, Bob. <laughs> Tiffany Denzik, 107 Birch Drive. Thank you so very much, Fire Department, for all the hard work and effort that you put into all those numbers. I greatly appreciate it. I know for a fact that Rossford can no longer function under part-time. I believe why, part of the reason why the police officer situation is going to work out is because the police officers, they have full-time staff. They're not operating on a volunteer show up, and I believe that's why that's going to work. Unfortunately, my family has had the opportunity to use volunteer before, and it's been a drain on every one of them. The first time my dad had to use it was on 24 heading east. Two kids in a Dodge Omni ran a stop sign at Dutch Road, hit his fuel tank on his truck, and exploded. Him and another trucker put it out. The 14-year-old passenger that was killed and the 19-year-old driver that had to be extricated from a little Dodge Omni was not a pretty situation. Those were all volunteer from water at the time. They had to go home to their families. It was that call came in at oh dark 30. When my neighbor's garage caught on fire, the first person on the scene was Jimmy Verbosky because he lives here. First person on the scene. Our lots are 55 feet apart. We know that. We knew that with having that house there, but there is a fire hydrant in my neighbor's yard. The fire department was able to put the fire out. I know it's only property, but I work three jobs for that property. I want my property safe. I live in this town based on services that the street commission provides. I can get to and from any time of day that I want to, no matter what is going on in the weather. And I do. I do. I've also helped move people here for that very same reason, who have 24-7 jobs, who need to get to Detroit, who need to get you name it, because we have great city services. But we need a full-time fire department. It needs to be funded full-time. And I don't want somebody from Perrysburg Township responding to 107 Birch Drive. I don't think they're going to make it in time. Sure, they can hit the highway. Sure, they can do a lot of other things. But we have a fire department here. And they want to work. But they're not going to work for a part-time basis. I teach aerobics part-time. That doesn't give me any benefits. I couldn't support a, a family. I've worked here at the Rossford Rec Center on a part-time basis. That doesn't provide you any benefits. That's something that you do. They have families. <coughs> The last time my family had to use the volunteer fire department was when my dad killed himself. Shot himself on a Sunday afternoon in the head, a week before Thanksgiving. Those people were all enjoying themselves. And yet they had to come to the house and sit there with the family and wait until the coroner showed up. That should not be something that is a part-time job. Those folks have to go back home. They have to go back to work that next day. They, they have seen unimaginable things that I don't want to have to imagine to see. I had a problem for four years after that, let alone them having to go work somewhere else for a full-time job, 12-hour shifts, 24-hour shifts. I ultimately had to call the fire department here three and a half years ago. I didn't know whether I was having a stroke. I didn't know if my cancer went to my brain. I didn't know if I was having an aneurysm. Those two guys that showed up were already working for Toledo. They had to get up, and then they had to go to work. It is, it is not, our, our population is aging. We cannot go on the model that we've gone. 
When I read Rossford's CAFER for 2020 to 2021, I saw a $300,000 increase in property taxes, and I saw a $3 million increase in income taxes. That was from 2020 to 2021. When I pulled up the city of Rossford's audit, which just go to auditor.stateohio, um, first tab down is going to be audits, financial audits. Click on that top right hand side, you're going to see a blue search bar, type in Rossford, and you can pull up our audit from December 31st, 2022. Governmental activities. Net position of the city governmental activities increased by 6,366,508. Much of this increase was related to increase in both property and income tax revenue. That says that on page 10. It's also going to give you a similar situation on page 5. Financial highlights. Key financial highlights for 2022 are as follows. In total, net position increased by 6,284,06. Net position of governmental activities increased 6,336,508 from 2021. It goes on to talk about, um, among the funds, the general fund had $11.9 million in revenue and $6.1 million in expenditures. The general fund's total balance increased, increased by 3,923,741 to $17,072,694. I'm not 100% convinced that we need a levy. I'm not saying that we don't need a levy. But I'm just reading the finances that are out here on the state of Ohio's website based on your audits. I don't think that the three options that we're being presented right now are going to give us what we need. I really don't. I think the fire department is what they presented gives us a starting ground. And then let's see what we can do from whether we need to do some negotiations with some of the outside communities. But it's not going to get us around what we need, which is the ISO. We need that insurance piece. We are growing. It's showing in our numbers. And in order for us to continue to grow, we cannot fund this how we funded it. And nor did it ever deserve to be funded this way. You should never have had to be put through all this. And I'm truly sorry that you all have been. But I thank you all for your time and attention, and I thank you for everyone that's put so much effort into this. Thank you. Erin Crawford, 544 Brunch Drive. Um, I just want to urge council to consider both short and long-term options as you're working your way through this. I mean, not to play devil's advocate, but let's say we put something on the ballot for a levy and the levy doesn't pass. We could be standing here a year from now with no further progress. We need something to protect our community now and something that will work for our community in the long term. I don't have the answers. I know you're working on it. I know everyone here uh, is showing up to get their input and care for it, but I don't want to continue to go on months or years from now and not have anything change. So that's all I have to say. And also, the last thing I want to say is that uh, I do believe we need a ladder truck in our community, and I'm not sure why we got rid of the one that we had. Whether it was not working, or whether it needed repairs, or whether we sold it to another community, we need one in our community, and uh, that's a high priority. Thank you. Thank you. Louis Bauer, 271 Margaret Berryburg. I guess I have a question or a follow up comment to Mr. Euler asking that it be evaluated on the Berryburg Township proposal. But my understanding is there isn't a proposal as of this time. You're not going to have it until probably the end of February. And you don't have a cost. Um, and without that, Tom is you know, you can't make a budget statement that it's something you should do for, you know, until you have those numbers. And it's daunting. I mean, the amount of information and the amount of possibilities are not simple. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, I don't want to take it out of context. There are some contractual agreements, and this is why I asked the question earlier, that supplement 
supplement um, mutual aid. For example, if Rochford started their own department, that there may be an offset of areas if somebody is a first responder versus the other community and or cost. And we have a second section of roster that cannot be forgotten. I mean, Joyce is sitting there, and I've known Joyce since high school. And so there's a lot of different issues, but some of that can be contractual in supplementing whatever you do if you decide not to disband and go to that route. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, Matt Giles, 209 Birch Drive. Uh, I moved into Rossford in 1983. It took me five years to get on the department because there were just no openings. And uh, got on in 1987. I retired in 2021. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't even do the financing in my own house, so I can't really tell you guys what to do, but I hope you do the right thing. I know you got a lot of work ahead of you. I would like to stick up for the guys in the department. I've known a lot of them a long time, been good friends with a lot of them, and I hear out in the community right now that if they would just do their job, we would have no problems right now. That, that, nothing could be further than the truth. I mean, when I got out in 87, we did about... 300 runs a year. I think last year they did 1,300. You're asking them to do something that's pretty much impossible. They work 12 hours, 24 hours at Rossford. They leave, they go to another community just to make some more money. And I, I think that's asking a lot of them. Uh, Mr. Segura, Chris, Lieutenant Segura, not a good friend of mine, but I did work with him for about five years. I hear his name getting trashed all through the community. He's nothing but a troublemaker. I don't think we'd be at this point right now if Chris didn't bring this to the community, um, the state that the fire department's in. I worked with Chris five years. You're not going to find a better fireman or a better EMS person. Um, that's really all I got. So, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the audience? Okay. State Fire Marshal and Mayor. I have a rare mob of talents. What I just witnessed, and I don't know if you were paying attention to it, but the people that were in the back room who got up and left fairly rapidly. In the police service and the fire service, those people who put their hands up, are prepared to die for you. So when you're trying to come up with a solution here, and I've been listening to everything that everybody's saying, guess what, you're all right. But the question is, how do you narrow it down based on what you can actually afford to do? And as a community, are you prepared to go maybe to a two or three tier type process to maybe where you take portions of those plans that you have and initiate them based on timetables until you can get to the next mark. Your city is growing rapidly. It is difficult for anybody inside the system to do it in a volunteer basis because it's too many people, too many runs, too many other things that are required by state and national standards that it's just impossible to do. So what I'm thinking here in, in listening is that it is, it is obvious to me that you all care. 
that you really care about your fire service. But I can also say that each one of those plans that you have, all of them would work if you're prepared to support. Every one of them would work. I can tell you that as the former chief and, and uh, mayor in Toledo, that we actually did merge a fire department inside the city of Toledo. We actually took Ottawa Hills and they became part of Toledo. Now when we did that, we also took in their firefighters. And a lot of them actually retired from the Toledo Fire Department. But they had to meet the standard and they met it. So it isn't that it was just cock launch. They had to be able to meet the standard. So I'm thinking that if you're willing to just give it a little bit of time and they were gone and they're trying to get to wherever they're going in less than five minutes. If you just take a break here for a second. Quit beating each other up because I'm watching that from the backside too. You guys are a family. Whether you like it or not, you live in Rostered, you are a family. And I can see that being an outsider, that you are a family. Your fire service was started in 1915. Your first station was 1957. Just about the time I was born. And I'm an old man with gray hair. <laughs> so why can't you figure out a way to work through this? You do need the help of other fire services. As a state fire marshal, one of the things that I think really inhibits people from being able to be successful is a refusal to try to work with other departments. If I'm a representative, state representative, or senator, and I'm looking at groups that are working together, I'm more willing to give grants and things like that to the groups that are working together than I am to groups that are trying to be individualized. So you have an opportunity here working with other fire services to be able to move your whole service to the next level. You're not back in 1915. You're not back in 1957. You're now in 2024. Things do change in that amount of time. And you have to be able to change with it. You have to be able to bend a little bit. I think that, like I said, each one of those plans would be highly successful if you all were willing to believe in yourselves and believe in being able to do it right. But one thing you cannot do is ignore those people that were sitting back there that walked out of this room to help you. Because somehow they, they become a thing instead of a person. But they're prepared to die for you. <coughs> So you should be prepared if there's an ability, and I heard that said earlier, that, and it seemed like there were a lot of people, to put a levy on, that's fine, but maybe you need to be able to take the other step too, but by working with the other department at the same time, going down two tracks. Because if people don't agree with what you're saying in here about the levy, then at least you're moving forward on something that's still going to be able to protect your city. What most fire departments work off of is a response time. And that's what you need to be able to question yourselves when we're sitting here talking about whether we need this or that one. Can you make that response in five minutes or seven minutes? Whatever you decide as a city. And are you comfortable with that? Because if you can't, then you know that your, your department and the resources you're putting to it are too small for what you need to do and you need to be able to bring other help into it. So I, I just, I know I'm an outsider. I probably don't even have a right to speak here. But as a former fire chief for 16 years, working with Rossford and everybody else, okay, I thought it would just be inappropriate to sit back here and walk away, not say anything, when I know better because in when I when I work throughout the state, I know that the, the cities that work together are the ones that move forward. So that's all I wanted to say. I, I just couldn't walk, especially watching them leave. 
it was just too emotional for me to, to ignore that when we're sitting in here, we're really asking, we're really focusing on the lives of people who just walked out the door. And so you've got to figure out how to take care of them and being able to take care of yourself. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Bell, for that unique perspective. We appreciate that you came up and, and talked. You're always welcome. Chris Segura, 624 Grounds Drive. Um, we were told just on, just before on or just after the first of the year, we would have some type of full-time coverage. And we're still months away from that. I know the time frame that uh, for Perry's the Township to take over was four to six weeks. There's no way. They still have to hire people. They still have to get all of their stuff situated on their end before they can do anything with us. Along with that, um, we mentioned that the proposal was coming from Perrysburg Township. Someone else had mentioned us doing our homework for that, but you guys read. We did our homework. I do not feel that the administration did their homework when they put together those three options that they gave you. The numbers seem arbitrary. Again, there was no proposal from our end that I'm aware of written to Township. How is that possible? How can all these numbers be presented to you guys with nothing in writing proposed to the city that they want to take us over? It doesn't make sense. Now we're weeks out from them finishing their proposal because they're doing their homework. And then what happens after that? You guys may be presented that and then we have two, maybe three council meetings before that's figured out. That, that number coming from them could be astronomical. We might not even be able to entertain it. $1.6 million, I feel, is somewhat arbitrary. Um, and they could come back way more than that. Again, we don't know because we don't have anything <coughs> in writing, hard writing, firm proposal to them. We're waiting on their proposal. How and why? Um, Chief Bell mentioned family. He said it was all, we're all family, right? Community. Think of it as uh, your extended family, right? We all live together work together. Um, those guys that ran out the door, they're my family. My, my brothers and sisters. So when I was getting up to walk out, they knew that this is just as important to me as being the officer on that engine putting out the fire right now. Like Andrew said, we don't want to go to EMS calls. Unfortunately, it's 90% of our run volume. We love it just as much as going to fires. But fires are more fun, let's be honest. So going and putting out that fire right now is one of my greatest passions. But being here and taking care of the people in the community and my brothers and sisters is also one of my greatest passions. So when they were walking out the door and I was following behind them, they said, hey, we got you. Stay and do what you need to do. So for the fire department, to all of you guys, we got you. When we're available. Um, it's been mentioned that more than half of us work full-time departments. We can't be there all the time. We don't have the numbers to support that. Going forward, being full time with the numbers that we presented you guys, we got you with that because it's adequate. What we have now is not adequate. We're getting by, but it's not working, obviously. We're relying on other departments, and those departments have their needs to fulfill too, and they won't always be there. Um, along with the other departments, to my understanding, we are one or two meetings away from the co op option with Northwood back in November. Apparently that meeting was walked away from by our city administration, again, if I understand correctly, to pursue this township option. Why? Why did that happen? There was already meetings happening and things being put in place for the co-op that's option two on our papers that we were presented. Why was it just abandoned? Did Bob Mack have something to do with it? I, I don't know. I believe that Bob Mack and Mr. McKinnon are friends. Again, I don't know if that's facts or not, but we're very seems, close friends. Seems kind of ironic that uh, one meeting away from a co-op of Northwood and their walk it's walk abandoned to go with Perrysburg Township. Again, I don't have any backing on that. It's just putting two and two together. Um, you were saying that our other departments that help us when we um, are inadequately staffed, um, they're not always in our station. The Northwood response for for us, they're responding from Station 83. The only people that we had coming in and working at our station was Lake. 
they're no longer doing that. They're no longer providing that coverage. Township responds for their, from their station, North will respond from their station. The coverage is provided, they do answer calls, we're not available, but they were not coming from our station all the time. Another gentleman said that we, uh, the union failed at some portion of this, I don't remember what all you said. Um, the last two contracts that I've helped negotiate, I the first thing I asked for was full-time staffing. Both of those times we were told they don't have the money for it. The city does not have the money for it. So we continued on with our negotiations, kind of on with our plan B of getting away from the, or going with the full-time staffing because we were told it wasn't possible. Our contracts last <coughs> multiple years. We are towards the end of our in the second contract that I negotiated, so it was six years ago. It was even more longer than that that uh, we were told that staffing was inadequate, or that council was told staffing was inadequate. Going back even farther, other people have mentioned it. <coughs> so it's just this can's been kicked down the road year after year after year, and now it's a problem because someone had said that we will have full-time staffing. Now it seems rushed to get that staffing in place. We're already past the deadline that was we were told. And we're still months away from anything going forward. The 911 calls are still coming in. The people are not coming in to us. We talked about recruitment and retention. We shot ourselves in the foot with that. Do you think anyone wants to come here with this possibility of our job being given away? Or losing your job in a couple of months when Perry Township takes over? Absolutely not. They can go elsewhere and make quite a bit more money <coughs> and have a secure job. <coughs> we shot ourselves in the foot with getting people in here and keeping them. We were a stepping stone department, and we somewhat still are. I started on this department before getting a full-time job. I was lucky enough to get a full-time job. That doesn't happen with your full-time departments, for the most part. It is starting to become a more common thing with lateral transfers, especially when local <coughs> departments are paying almost $100,000 a year for lateral transfer. Um, but for the most part, a full-time department, you're not going to have that coming and going of personnel. Once they're in a department, a full-time department, they may move to a bigger department, but for the most part, they're staying here, there for their 25, 30 year career. Because now that's their department, and now that's their people that they're taking care of. So we won't have the recruitment and retention problem, I don't feel, if we do go forward with our own people doing full-time. Hope you all make, uh, think for yourselves on this, make an informed decision, and please do your homework. I did offer a meeting to all of you, and it, I didn't mean it as a group. I'm sorry if it seemed that way, um, but I do get the sunshine, sunshine law that we call can't be as a group. I wanted to talk with all of you to maybe provide you more information that you might not have been provided, and I hope we've done that with things that we've provided you up to this point. If you have any questions for me about the department, the union, please reach out. Get a hold of me. Thank you. I do have one question. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? I'll just keep talking about this. Good now? Yep. Okay. Uh, one quick question. With this proposal that you guys made, what's the time frame? If we decided to do a six or eight person team, what's the time frame to staff that? So we would have to go through the testing process still, right? Because civil service. Uh, sure. Um, I'm just ballpark. Ballpark. Um, four months. On the low end or on the high end? Two to four months. Right. And we already have people in place, right? So that part-time model is already there. Uh, if we hire full-time people, we're pulling from that part-time staffing. So now we are gonna start stat, uh, recruiting part-time people as well as full-time people because the handful of people that raise their hand back there, I mean, if we're all testing fairly, then there is an opportunity there, or a chance that someone might not pass the test. That doesn't mean they lose their job as a part-time person. That just means they didn't qualify for that full-time position. So we still have our part-time people in place. Um, I said this in a, count, or a public safety committee meeting last year sometime. Flyer after flyer after flyer for job postings for full-time departments. Um, I had all of them. Every time one of those comes out, we lose a pool of people that we could potentially hire. And that was years ago. That's continuing to happen while we're sitting here figuring this out. 
and that pool is dwindling. Uh, Rose talked about the first person that talked. This the fire service people aren't interested in that as much as when I first tested for a full-time department, I tested with 3,000 people. The last test that we put on for Toledo, I believe there was 400, 500 people that took the test, something like that. So to answer your question, two to four months, best case scenario. Thank you. Any other council comments for us? Thanks for getting up again and speaking. I just wanted to let you know, last Monday I met with five individuals. My only complaint was they wouldn't let me drive the truck or use the AED. <laughs> and now it cost me ice cream. Uh, Did you ask? They, what's that? Did you ask? What, for ice cream? No, the AED. Oh, no, my fault. Um, they handled themselves professionally, are safe. I, the police department and and the fire department everybody i have dealt with very professional you know and i thank you guys for everything you guys do thank you for coming. police and fire station that applies to any of you guys too please come on a drill weekend or drill monday or any day that you're available come shadow one of our crews for a 12 hour shift eight hour shift how long you can be there come see what we do for you. <coughs> Thank you. I think we're going to go ahead and council remarks at this time. Um, and I guess I'll start because I, I will go. I appreciate everyone coming and speaking tonight and sharing their thoughts and perspectives. Um, I think we gathered a lot of good information. I'm happy with how the, the meeting went. Um, we covered a lot and a, and a lot was said, but I think, I think it gives some thoughts of pathways to go forward. Um, there's some surprises on things that the citizens said that they would would want or would do. And I think that's really very helpful for us um, going forward. Um, and and like Chris pointed out, that, that if we did decide to go with our own apartment, that could be two to four months. Um, if we decide to go with Bearsford Township, we have to get their proposal and then I would imagine the calendar proposal so that takes some time to um, so um, bear with us and hang in there we are going to get this done it probably won't be as quick as as hoped but we're working on it um, constantly Chris uh, thanks again to all the community that came out and gave their input um, I just want to echo what Ms. Ackle said. Um, today was all about listening and all about seeing and list, uh, hearing everyone's point of view, including our uh, current fire department. So I appreciate everyone's input, and I'm sure that we will uh, hopefully hit the ground running moving forward. So thank you all very, very much. Again, I want to echo what my two other members said. I do want to say again to the time frame, Chris, we were blindsided just like you are. We, I'm being honest, we, it was hard for us. We knew this was not gonna work in four to six weeks as soon as we saw it, we would be honest. And uh, I hope that you appreciate that we do need some time. Again, I know I asked for it the last time. We are actually working on this all the time. It's, I do think about it probably all the time, about what the right direction for our town is. So um, again, I understand the right answer might not be the easy answer, and that's the end of it. None of them are going to be easy. Um, but please, it is thought, it's going to be a thoughtful process, and uh, I'll probably be calling you again. So again, please call me or contact me if you have any questions or concerns that we didn't cover today. I want you to do it. It's firetinny at rosterohio.com. Just email me. Let um, me get my phone number from you later. You get. Um, but I appreciate you all so much for coming and taking your time and this long night to do something important for a town. I uh, appreciate everybody coming out uh, and, and giving their two cents. Uh, it, is, it is necessary uh, for us to make an uh, informed decision. Um, and for those of you that want to or need to speak with me, email is the best option. Uh, I check it every day. Uh, Zach, I hope that's 
Seal. Is that one? Nebraska Park? <laughs> I think that's what it is. Yeah. Um, but I, I wanted to be clear from my standpoint that I have not made any decisions and don't feel like I am in a position yet to make a decision because we don't have all proposals to put together and therefore, I think I said this in the last council meeting, time frame from my standpoint can't be put together. So while we all feel like safety is a necessity uh, and, and it's a problem for us right now, uh, I won't make a hasty decision. Thanks again for everybody coming out, asking questions. Um, these proposals in my mind are a starting point. And nowhere I, out of the three, and then the one I, we got tonight, I call 1A um, from the firefighters, are each one of them has certain things, you know, certain good, certain bad. Um, once we make our decision and which way we go, and we're taking our sweet time, be, please be patient with us. We're not, this isn't something that we can come to, you know, overnight or because the problem hasn't been developed overnight. This has been an ongoing thing for six, seven years. And uh, just please be patient with us. Thank you. Well, uh, the downside of going last is that I'm not going to have much original to say. But I do want to thank everyone for coming out and, and sharing their opinions and their voices and their experiences because I think tonight was a huge and crucial part of this process. So I want to continue the conversation by talking to any of you. If you reach out to any of us, we're always happy to respond or meet individually. And so again, I think that this is this was a crucial part of this process tonight. And I think we've got a lot of good information and most importantly, we've gotten the public opinion. So I'd like to continue that conversation and keep this discourse going so that we can come up with the best possible solution. Motion to adjourn. Who did it? Chris, and you seconded. All those in favor of adjourning, please say aye. Any opposed?